40. This passage follows the passage that we referred to earlier when the uh, shepherds visited uh, Jesus. Luke 2, 21 onwards. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for the purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered a sacrifice according to what was required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man named Simeon who lived in Jerusalem. He was a righteous man and very devout. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he eagerly expected the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Lord, now I can die in peace. As you have promised me, I have seen the Saviour. You have given to all, uh, you, I have seen the Saviour, you have given to all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and Mary were amazed at what was being said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, this child will be rejected by many in Israel and it will be their undoing, but he will be the greatest joy to many others. Thus the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher and was very old. She was a widow for her hus husband had died when they had been married only seven years. She was now 84 years old. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God and fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph and she began praising God. She talked about Jesus to everyone who had been waiting for the promised king to come and deliver Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom beyond his years and God placed his special favour upon him. That is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here and also those who are joining us online. Before we uh, go any further, allow me to lead us in a short word of prayer. Father, we give you great thanks and praise for uh, this beautiful day where we can praise you, where we can sing of your goodness and your love. And Father, now as we quieten ourselves to listen to your word, uh, being explained. We pray, gracious God, for your Holy Spirit to be at work in me and through me and in each one of us as we listen and as we meditate and as we are being ministered by your Holy Spirit to uh, live the life that you called us to live. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please keep that Bible reading open in front of you from Luke chapter 2. So it is the 2nd of January, 2022. A fresh start. Um, the year is just a day and a half old, almost. Um, as the clock passed midnight on the 31st of December, uh, your phones would have been started buzzing 
uh, people sending messages, wishing you a very happy new year, a prosperous new year. Somebody wished me a better year than 2021. And a friend sent me a, a message uh, saying, may the 2022 be uh, a COVID-free year, or uh, by the end of 2022, COVID will be gone. So that is our prayer, isn't it? Um, and we needed that wish, don't we? We all had a, a, a very ordinary couple of years. And we needed that wish that this year would be better, better than the year that, is, that has gone by. But then, sadly, there are no signs that things are going to be different, or things will be changed or, or new. Uh, the pandemic hasn't just stopped at the, the midnight of, uh, of December 31st. I know it just has rolled over into the new year with us. And it is threatening to be the new norm for us. Perhaps some of our circumstances have done the same thing. It has just rolled over, come along to the new year with us. So how do we navigate this brand new year ahead of us? What can we do to make this year a better year? Especially in our COVID context. And I want to suggest one thing. I want us to aim as individuals and as a church to live a life devoted to God. Now, I missed clicking through a couple of slides. That was the our um, beautiful fireworks display, uh, the midnight, and um, yeah, a life devoted to God. That's what I would like us to aim for this year. Now, what does that mean? What does it look like to be living a life devoted to God? And from the passage that we read from Luke chapter 2, I want to put forward four marks of a life devoted to God. First, trust in Him. Trust in Him. From the beginning of Luke's gospel, Paul read a few uh, verses from uh, Luke chapter 2. But way before that, Luke, who is writing this gospel, has been piling up witnesses after witnesses uh, to tell the uniqueness of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. So far, there were the witness of the angels, the witness of Elizabeth and, and her husband, Zechariah, and then the witness of the, of the shepherds. And in Matthew, if you read the Matthew uh, Gospels, the birth narratives, we find the witness of the Magi. And here, in this passage that we read, we get two more witnesses, Simeon and Anna, two more people to confirm the identity of Jesus. And Simeon in particular uh, identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the one through whom God promises to bring salvation, not just for the people of Israel, no, for the whole world. Now, why does Luke pile up all these evidences for us? Now, if you, if you go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 1, you will remember or you will find out that Luke is writing this gospel to a guy by the name of Theophilus, who is a non-Christian. And Luke's main aim is that he provide a, a, a credible and orderly, very accurate account of the life of Jesus to Theophilus. So that Theophilus will have certainty of who Jesus is as he trusts in him. In that sense, the reason why Luke has piled up all these different witnesses is primarily for those who haven't trusted in Jesus. That they may have certainty of who Jesus is so that they can trust in him. So today, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, what would make this year a joyful year would be for you is to trust in Jesus. Look at the witnesses. Investigate the historical evidences of Jesus, for Jesus, his claims, his miracles, his teachings. Don't let another year go by 
without investigating who Jesus is and putting your trust in Jesus. Perhaps you might want to consider coming along to the Christianity Explored course that we are running uh, in February, from the 6th of February. And if you have trusted in Jesus, very well, very good. Keep trusting in him. Grow in, in your faith in Jesus this year. Now, if you were looking at the skies on, on the New Year's Eve, you would have seen this sign, this, this sky writing that came up uh, just before the fireworks kind of exploded at 9 o'clock. Uh, I guess it was a timely reminder for people, isn't it, to not to enter another year without trusting in Jesus. See, so friends, we don't know what the rest of the year is going to look like. But we know who does. And isn't it the wise thing to do to enter into the new year with the one who, who holds the future? Who knows the future? Who has the future in his hands and to trust in him? Second, obey him. Obey him. Have a look at Mary and Joseph. In, this, in these verses, six times in these 19 verses, Luke says that they obeyed the law of Moses or the law of the Lord, which is the word of God. Just glance through verse 21, verse 22, verse 23, verse 24, verse 27, and again in verse 39, again and again, Luke wants to point out that these two young people, Mary would have been just a teenager. They're showing their devotion to God by obeying the law of God or the word of God. They, they not only knew what to do, like most of us, but they did what they had to do, and they did it very carefully. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, God gave the law to the people, didn't he? Through Moses, to show them how to live as his people. Now, obeying the law made them unique, especially when they had come out of Egypt, after 400 years in Egypt, and they come to the promised land, a new land, and they were surrounded by different nations with different practices, and they needed to know how to live as the people of God. So law made them unique. Now, law didn't give them the promised land, did it? God didn't wait till all these people obeyed the law and, and, and uh, kept everything to the, to the last minute detail to give them the promised land. No, the promised land was a gift from God. Now, as we come to the New Testament, uh, we remember that like the promised land to the Israelites, salvation isn't something that we earn or we work for. Eternal life is not something God gives us because we have been good or religious or we've kept the law. As Paul explains, now no one will be made righteous in the sight of God by the works of law. Now, apart from the law, we are made righteous. We are made righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. Salvation, friends, is a gift from God. You and I are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. But that doesn't mean, friends, that the law of the word or the law, the word of God, doesn't have any effect on us. Paul says, faith doesn't nullify the law. Rather, we uphold the word of God or the law. Now that we have been saved by faith, we have been made righteous by faith in Jesus, we need the law, the word of God, to show how to live as God's people in the world, how to live as Christ's followers, 
By living according to the word of God, we demonstrate to the world around us that our citizenship is not here. We belong to God. Our citizenship is in heaven. Later in John chapter 14, Jesus says his beautiful words, right? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do you hear that? Do you see that? By keeping the commandments, by keeping the word of God, we will show our love, our devotion to Jesus. So, friends, let me encourage you to make it a priority this year to know God's word. God's word better and and live by it. Study it personally. Do it in groups. Use an app like YouVersion if you you have to. Foster and I, we found this really helpful. And I use that with a few others as well. Uh, There are different translations of the Bible. There are devotions that you can do on your own or as, as a group. Do whatever it is. Do whatever it takes to get into the word of God and And don't just listen to the word or read the word, but like James says, we must not merely listen to the word and deceive ourselves, but be doers. Do what it says. Obey the words of God. Third, a life devoted to God is marked with knowing him know him, knowing Jesus. We find Simeon in verses 25 to 35, don't we? By all accounts, he seems to be an old man. And we are told that he is righteous, he did the right thing by the people, and he's also a devout man, which means he did the right thing by God. Uh, He was a man filled with the Holy Spirit, he was also a man of waiting, a waiting man. He, he waited for the Messiah to appear. God had promised to him that he wouldn't die until the day he sees the Messiah, Jesus. So there is no doubt, friends, that Simeon spent a lot of time reading, combing through Scripture, looking for clues, promises, and, and finding those, uh, the prophecies about the Messiah. You see, the sole aim for Simeon's life was to see Jesus. He lived every day to see Jesus. But like Bono of the YouTube band, he would have gone to bed every night saying, I still haven't found what I was looking for. I still haven't found what I was looking for. But this particular day, when he walked into the temple, It was something different, wasn't it? And as he saw the baby Jesus in the the hands of Mary and and Joseph, and when he went towards them and held this baby in in his hands and looked directly into his eyes, he knew, finally, finally, I have found what I was looking for. The sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now, You dismiss your servant, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Now that he's seen Jesus, now that he has held Jesus, now that he has known Jesus, he he doesn't care what, what happens next. He is even ready to die. Later, the Apostle Paul says something similar, doesn't he, in, in Philippians He said that I count everything lost for the sake of knowing Christ. I count them rubbish, garbage compared to knowing Christ. Such an aim in life, such a priority in knowing Christ Jesus. Both Simeon and Paul had the same goal in life, didn't they? To know Jesus above everything else. Now, knowing Jesus is not just knowing about the facts about him. In the Bible, the word to know goes beyond 
knowing facts about a person. The apostle said what he meant by wanting to know Christ. and said, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering to become like him in his death and so attain somehow the resurrection from the dead. Can you see what he's trying to say? There's this sense that Paul wanting to know Christ inside and out so that he can be like Christ inside and out. So to know Christ then, friends, is to be like him more and more. To be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus. To do what he does to see what he sees, to think the way he thinks, to be humble like he is, to be generous like he is, to serve like him. This is the work of the Holy Spirit that that has begun in us, isn't it? The work of transformation to make us more and more and more like Jesus so that we will become fully like Jesus. Now, I don't know how many of you look at signs as you walk through the door. Uh, we've got two signs on the side. Uh, one one sign on my, onto my uh, left um, got graffitied over the last few weeks, few days, I guess. It's, it has become a bit of a whiteboard to, to someone who, uh, who want to go on a rant. Um, out of all the wild statements that they've made, there's this one thing that, that caught our eye. It says... The best Christian is a dead Christian. What do you think about that? The best Christian is a a dead Christian. Isn't that what we are on about? We are dead to sin, aren't we? We are alive to Christ. Now, he's got it spot on. I don't think he wanted to say that, but that is a Christian. The best Christian is a dead one dead to sin, alive to Christ. So friends, perhaps this year, as we face numerous challenges, ups and downs, and cheerful moments, and disappointments, and discouragements, and encouragements, let us intentionally allow the Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Jesus. As we sung earlier, to know Jesus And to know him more. And the final mark of our devotion to God is to serve him. Trust him. That was the second one, you remember? Obey him. The third one? Know him. Finally, serve him. I'll look at verses 36 to 39. We meet Anna. Uh, this old little lady. Uh, The reading that Paul had and the reading that I I had, uh, it says that she was 84 years old, but it is a bit doubtful whether she was 84 years old or whether she was actually a widow for 84 years old. Uh, Regardless, she was uh, somewhat old, Uh, again, uh, an old woman. And since her husband died seven years of being married, we are told that she was a widow. And she never left the temple. Now, that doesn't mean that she lived in the temple. No, which means if you had gone to her house and if she she was not in her house, probably the best guess is she's in the temple. What was she doing? Worshipping. Worshipping God. Interesting, the word for worship is also for word for serving. Offering religious services in the temple like a priest would do. Things like singing and and assisting in sacrifices or cleaning, praying. Luke identifies this lady as a prophetess, which means she actually handled the word of God. She spoke the word of God. Verse 38, her service extended to witnessing. Witnessing to who Jesus is. She was so excited, wasn't she? She was so excited when she saw baby Jesus and she couldn't hold herself. 
And what did she do next? She ended up telling people who Jesus is and sharing who Jesus is for everyone who was in the temple. Friends, when God saves us through Jesus, he also calls us for a life of worship, which is also a life of service. Not the select few, all of us. All of us are equipped in some way or the other to serve in his kingdom. Each of us are uniquely gifted to serve in ways that other people cannot serve. Not that God wants our service. I mean, he can save the whole universe in the twinkling of an eye. No, he graciously gives us the opportunities to serve alongside him, to build his kingdom. He gives us gifts, skills, and and he gives us resources, finances. He gives us time, energy to be used in his service. And the best place to start serving is here in the church. It's not the only place, but the best place to start serving is the church. So how can you serve today? How can you serve this year? Are you able to serve in more ways? Are you able to serve in different ways? Are you using your gifts well? Do you need to sharpen your skills? What is stopping you from serving? Is it fear? Lack of confidence? Is it life is so crowded and busy that you don't have energy and the time And I said, are you feeling like, I'm too old to serve? Well, I'm too young. I don't have the experience. Learn from Anna. Learn from Anna. She didn't let her age, her frailty, her gender, her social status, to stop her from serving God. And we shouldn't either. We shouldn't either. So we wish for a better year. A year free of COVID. A year of better things. The reality is COVID may or may not go away by the end of the year. Our circumstances may or may not change by the end of the year. It may not be a different year at all than last year, except it's 2022. But friends, we have a God who is faithful, powerful, merciful, good, loving, kind. And let us aim to live a life devoted to him. Trust in him. Obey him. Know him. And serve him. And as we do, friends, may we find his joy, his peace, his goodness flowing through to all the days of our lives, not just this year, despite our circumstances. I'm going to give us a a couple of moments to to reflect on, on this slide that is on the screen for you. What area do you think you need to work on Maybe you might want to ask God to give give you grace and strength to do any of these or all of these. Let's do that.
Heavenly Father, we, we thank you once again for the opportunity to start the year with these words. And Father, to, to remind ourselves a better year, a better life is a life that is devoted to you. So help us to trust, help us to obey, help us, Father, to know, know you more, and help us, Father, to serve you with our whole hearts. And as we do, may we find your grace, your goodness, your love, and satisfaction that comes from knowing, serving, worshipping and loving and obeying, trusting in you will be ours. May that be a contagious thing that whenever we go around, people will see and want to know what is the secret behind your joy, that satisfaction, that contentment. May we be able to point to Jesus. And we ask this, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.